because both sides that being organized business and the government uh, benefit from the relationship the way it is at the moment, we think that there are few prospects for pushes for reforms to come from big business um, as well. We at the Center for Risk Analysis have long argued that there are very few prospects for reform in the current administration. Why is this? Well, joining me to discuss is John Endres. He is a director of the CRA and also the co-author of our weekly risk alert. And in this week's alert, he highlighted the lack of reform intent, both in the government, but also in organized business. John, let's start off with government. Uh, why are we arguing that there is very little sign of reform at the moment? Well, David, thanks for having me on again. Um, and I think what we do quite a lot at the, risk, at the Center for Risk Analysis is that we read the tea leaves. Uh, that means we look for small signals in the environment that give us some idea of which way things are going. And when you put these small signals together, you often can come up with quite an accurate picture. As you say, one of the small signals we picked up on were responses to uh, DA MPs' questions in Parliament this past week, where the uh, mining minister said that mining legislation uh, was not really any obstacle to mining investment, and the finance minister said that uh, race-based Black economic empowerment policy was also no barrier to investment or no disincentive to investment. And what that indicates to us in the face of very low investment levels, both in mining and in the broader economy, is that the uh, government is really not in a mental space where it is considering any meaningful reform, but that it considers the current uh, state of play to be quite acceptable and one that will be pursued into the future. And that, of course, is very much based on uh, a, a sound set of ideological principles that see the state as being central to the economic development of the country and to the success of, of society more broadly. And as long as those principles remain in place, we should not expect any substantial reforms. Okay, so that's government. And what about the organized business community? Because one would think that big business would be trying to lobby for liberalization, for pro-market reformists, but we don't really seem to be seeing any of that. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that... Uh, business and organized business, big business in particular, um, has found ways of accommodating itself with the government. In a way, it is a symbi symbiotic relationship uh, where the government benefits from the tax resources that big business contributes. It also uh, benefits in the form of uh, party donations, for example, which seem to have dried up a little bit, um, but certainly in the past, that was the case. And then, of course, uh, conversely, uh, big business can also benefit from regulations that help it. In some ways, big business, of course, is in favor of uh, markets not being too free because that would stimulate quite a lot of competition from, from the smaller guys. Uh, and so you do see things like uh, net lack negotiations, for example, or the extension of uh, bargaining council agreements to industry sectors that allow large companies to uh, benefit from those arrangements, but really risk closing out the smaller guys. Uh, and so because both sides, that being organized business and the government, uh, benefit from the relationship the way it is at the moment, we think that there are few prospects for pushes for reforms to come from big business um, as well. Enjoying this analysis? Click here to sign up for our 30-day free trial for more content from the CIA. Okay, John, and in the risk alert, you also noted with uh, some curiosity that the official opposition hasn't really been able to capitalize that they have uh, some good ideas uh, and governance reforms, uh, economic policy reforms, but these don't really seem to be taken seriously by big business and also the mainstream media. Mm. And uh, you know, there are several reasons for that. Um, and I think, as you say, there are, there are some good ideas out there in terms of governance reform, economic reform, and so on. They're not really gaining traction, though. Um, and one of the reasons, I think, is that the, uh, the, the most widely held worldview in broader society, and I would include in that the media and many civil society organizations, mirrors that of the ANC itself, which is very much a status, developmental, centralized kind of worldview, uh, where, where the state is really the, the arbiter of good and evil, and also the, um, the, the, the main enabler of progress in, in society. And that is a, a worldview that I think is one that is not working out very well at the moment. But because it is so dominant, 
alternative worldviews that place more uh, emphasis on the individual and on individual responsibility and the ability of people to really uh, uh, enact progress in their own lives seems to come up a bit short. And that is the reason why the official opposition, for example, despite its good ideas and also its track record in governance, in good gov governance, is uh, failing to advance as much as it really should. It is dismissed uh, out of hand when really it should be seriously considered. And the irony there is that uh, the attention of the media seems to be focused on supposed uh, reform elements within the government, which are glaringly absent, or uh, it seems to be focused on hoping that big business will push for reforms, which of course it doesn't either. Um, so there's a, a, a great imbalance there, I think, in the, in the shape in which emphasis is placed on the prospects for reform. Those prospects really lie much more with the official opposition than they do with government or with organized business. All right, John. So we seem to have a, a kind of a stasis at the moment where the political and policy status quo doesn't look to be shifting. There's no real pressure from business. Uh, so ordinary South Africans who might be watching this video might be asking and wondering to themselves, well, where is this all heading? Because some of our social and economic problems are only getting worse. Uh, so do you see any prospect for change on the horizon? Well, David, I think, you know, the, the sort of obvious within the box kind of signs that you'd be looking for would be, for example, on the part of government for cabinet ministers to give distinctly different answers to what they've been doing the past week. That would be one sign of, of reforms. Another one would be business speaking out more clearly and more eloquently, more forcefully against harmful policies. And a third would be if we saw the official opposition or the um, various opposition parties discover strategies uh, that were uh, more effective in combating the harmful policies that we're seeing at the moment, then you would see a shift within the system. And we've just described to you that we're not really seeing that at the moment. However, there is the punctuated equilibrium theory, which um, is something we've spoken about, I think, previously on the show, which says that often you see these very long periods of stasis where nothing seems to change, and then unexpectedly and suddenly you see quite a considerable shift. And there are reasons to think that South Africa might experience something like that in the next few years. The reason for that is that it seems to be a rule in South African history that whenever the state run, runs out of money, as expressed in very considerable fiscal deficits, then some form of regime change follows some years after that. And that was the case after the First World War, after the Second World War, and also in the 1980s. And in each of those three cases, uh, there were huge government deficits, and a few years later, there would be a change in government. And currently, of course, we're in a similar situation where we do have these very large um, deficits, 14% uh, of GDP last year, uh, to be continued in the, into the coming years. And if this rule of South African history is to be confirmed, then we should expect some sort of uh, shift in the next few years. Uh, it's hard to say how that will look or where it will come from, but um, it is uh, quite, quite possible that that is going to happen. And one of the small signals that you picked up on in the risk alert, John, was that the ANC itself is ailing uh, under the burden of financial pressures and other kind of operational problems. Uh, do you have any final thoughts on the state of the ANC at the moment? Mm. I think that the news that came out over the weekend that the release from prison of Mr. Zuma had been green lighted by uh, Mr. Ramaphosa, by the president, is significant because it is another signal that shows us that there's no reform intent within the ANC and that the uh, uh, anti-corruption language that is used by the ANC really is language, it's more for show than for substance. And really the purpose of these uh, actions is to make sure that ANC members do not end up in jail, or if they do, do not stay there for very long. So I think the ANC um, is, is continuing along its track. It looks like it is falling apart a little bit at the moment. And uh, that is a reason why you should think about what the country could look like with the ANC no longer in charge. That is something that can happen in the next few years. And uh, certainly as a subscriber to the CRA, uh, do consider your options about how to prepare for that eventuality because it is becoming more likely. John Andrews, thank you very much. If you would like to gain access to our weekly risk alerts and you're not already a client of the CRA, you can join us on our 30 day free trial. There's a link in the description below. Also, if you would like to watch our earlier discussion on the punctuated equilibrium thesis, you can watch that video over here. My name is David Ansara. This is the CRA. Until next time, take care.